Once upon a time, in a land far away, there lived a nameless monster. The monster was dying to have a name. So the monster made up his mind and set out on a journey to look for one. And then one day, a boy came upon the monster who had gone west. I have a name, said the boy, and it's such a wonderful one in that. But the monster who went west replied, Who needs a name? I'm perfectly happy without one. After all, that's what we are. Nameless monsters. The boy ate up the monster who went west. At last he had found a name, but there was no longer anyone to call him by it. Such a shame, because Johan was such a wonderful name. Johan is best described as an entity of pure evil, genetically optimized to be the perfect specimen. His exceptionally crafted facade helps him gain the trust of many people by giving off a sense of pureness and goodwill. But deep down within his fake exterior lies a monster, one that can deliver destruction and suffering to anyone in its way. In this video, we'll be looking at how Johan manipulates his victims. So sit back, grab some snacks and enjoy. Before we dive into Johan's manipulation tactics, I want to quickly break down Johan's childhood and beliefs so that we can gain a better understanding of why he rejects humanity and why he expresses a nature of nihilism. Nihila what? A nihilist is someone who believes that life is meaningless and rejects all religious and moral principles. You see, even as a child, Johan's goal was to be the last human standing. Johan and his sister Nina, formerly known as Anna, were born as part of a eugenics experiment to create the ultimate Czechoslovakian race ran by Franz Benaparte in hopes of creating a child with not only high intelligence and flawless appearance but one who could lead the human race itself. This ultimately gave birth to the nameless monster. As a child, Johan was sent to an orphanage called 511 Kinderheim, which was an experimental orphanage with the goal of creating the perfect soldier. This is where Johan displayed his first true act of evil at the young age of 10. Through the use of manipulation, he convinced the instructors and all the children at 511 Kinderheim to kill each other. And in episode 12, Hartman explains that Johan did this by simply adding fuel to the hatred born when people come together. I cool, but how does he manipulate people? Okay, so Johan uses a variety of dark psychological tools and methods to manipulate his prey. But today we'll be taking a look at the most prominent ones. The first being persuasion. This psychological tool relies on emotional appeal and logical fallacies to make its case rather than logical reasoning. Okay, but why does Johan use this tool specifically? Simple, because it's extremely effective. You see, Johan uses it to create loyal, obedient, and submissive followers. A great example of this is in episode 6. 63, when he convinced serial killers to go against their own beliefs to satisfy his needs. The first of the serial killers is Reynard. who tries to justify the killing of people as a result of their lack of morality. But even he admits that the person he killed for Johan left a bad taste because the person was an upstanding citizen who did nothing wrong. Then you have the second serial killer who believed he needed to drink young girl's blood, specifically virgin's blood, in order to stay alive. But here's what's weird, the victim he killed on behalf of Johan was not a virgin. In fact, she gave birth at the age of 17 and he already knew about this. So do you know what he said when he was questioned about it? The very same thing. 
that it left a really bad taste. Then finally we have the last serial killer and probably the weirdest one who claims to kill people that aliens tell him to kill through some sort of message but this time he claims that he didn't get any message from an alien but rather he met one in person. Can you guess who he's talking about? Yep, clearly he's referring to Johan. Bro, what's wrong with this guy? It's pretty clear at this point that Johan manipulated these men into abandoning their beliefs and killing for his own benefit. Johan wants his victims to experience the worst possible pain, loss, and suffering. Rather than just killing people himself, he wants to see them suffer until they commit suicide. And he uses a manipulation tool called gaslighting to achieve this. What's that? Gaslighting is a form of emotional abuse in which the abuser deliberately tries to undermine the victim's sense of reality. You see, the aim is to create confusion and doubt in the victim's mind so that they second guess their own memories and perceptions. Over time, the victim may start to doubt their own sanity. Detective Lunge mentions that Johan leaves such a strong impression that he's able to convince people to do anything by altering the fulcrum of one's identity. This is just like removing a map's coordinate axis. We actually see this in action in episode 29 when Johan uses gaslighting to get Richard into questioning his own reality. And by using this tactic, Johan manages to convince Richard into drinking despite him being sober and trying to get his life back together. Unfortunately, he ends up falling into Johan's trap, giving Johan exactly what he wants. Another dead victim and his hands being clean. His next victim was General Wolf. Instead of killing Wolf directly, Johan much rather enjoys destroying him mentally. After Wolf found Johan and his sister, he visited them at the hospital and when he asked Johan how he was feeling, Johan said you'll know very soon. But why? You see, Johan wanted Wolf to experience what he was feeling and how he did this was by killing everyone close to Wolf. And I mean everyone, all the people he truly cared about and everyone who truly knew him, effectively erasing Wolf's identity. This greatly affects Wolf, who describes it as though his name was erased from existence itself. And this is further emphasized just before Wolf dies, when he tells Tenma his real name, begging him to say it aloud as evidence of his existence. But ultimately he dies in the complete and utter solitude forced upon him by Johan. There are different types of blackmail, such as extortion, coercion, and commercial pressure. But you see, Johan doesn't really care about monetary gain. So the type of blackmail he focuses on the most is coercion. What the frick is that? Coercion doesn't usually involve money, at least not directly. Instead, it involves persuading someone to do something by using force or threats. Let's take a look at an example when Johan uses this. In episode 21, we find out that the detectives who killed Nina's adopted parents were actually blackmailed by Johan, who found out that they were selling drugs they would confiscate from criminals in order to make extra money. This made it extremely easy for Johan to blackmail them. All he had to do was threaten to report them if they ever refused to do as they were told. So freaking easy, bro. In hopes of acquiring an important tape that reveals secrets of his childhood, Johan disguised himself as Nina, his sister. Sheesh! Yep, my guy managed to convince an actual detective that he was a girl. So much so that Suk developed feelings for him after only meeting him once. Yeah, that brother's starving. Yeah, I feel sad for this dude. But ultimately, this works great for Johan as he eventually gains access to the tape and alters what was on it. You see, Johan is described as chaos incarnate. He's able to assess anyone's psychology and motives perfectly. He has extraordinary levels of intelligence. Even in his childhood, his intelligence was unmatched. I mean, the guy started a very successful underground bank at the age of 15. Dang! Anyway, real quick before we 
we wrap things up i just want to introduce a new segment called comment of the day where i'll pick one really interesting comment from one of my videos and react to it and today's comment of the day comes from my yuichi video and it's by all world zeus who says i think yuichi is a sociopath he said that the old him would have done it in a heartbeat to me that shows some sign of change isn't a psychopath more likely to change he clears battles with himself enough as he says in season one that he doesn't need any friends and then he chooses his friends in my eyes i just see him as a person willing to burn his bridges maybe i'm overthinking it but that's what i think all right first of all cool name by the way zeus is actually one of my favorite gods from greek mythology and secondly this is something i never really considered and i think it's really cool to see it from a different perspective i guess so i really wanted to share it with the community and thanks for taking the time to share this with us i really appreciate it so if you enjoyed the video or found it useful in any way be sure to warm and smash that like button and subscribe to join the spartan army and until next time guys peace